I just leaving a black screen. Here. Great, That's excellent. Okay, guys. Um, so let's. Uh, we're getting started a little bit late, so I just want to go ahead and and move things ahead. Um, I'm Heather Love. Welcome, and this is the psychology of pinkwashing. So, I'm just going to um, introduce our speakers um, uh, in turn as they come up, and um, uh, we have a really great lineup today. So. Um, our first speaker is um, J.L. Haycock. Jay has researched and worked with counter pinkwashing activism for the last two years, beginning with Al Kaos. They have stayed involved behind the scenes of pinkwashing research and counter pinkwashing print and hope to continue this effort when returning to academia for law school in the fall. Um, so Jay today will be talking about queering the frameworks of pinkwashing. Thanks. All right, thanks everyone. Can you hear me, this thing on? Yeah? All right, brilliant. So I'm here to talk today about pinkwashing in historical context. This is just a part of a much larger uh, behemoth of a history paper, so this isn't going to be comprehensive. You'll have to forgive me for that. Um, those that pinkwash and those that get taken in by it will often say that Israel has helped gay Palestinians, that Israel has an excellent record on gay rights, and there's nothing wrong with highlighting that. There are a lot of components to what pinkwashing is about and to what its purpose is, but it is not about gay rights. I'm gonna to speak today on just a part of what it is about and just one of the historical frameworks that it's built upon, that of Orientalist feminism. I'd like to begin with an excerpt from a 2009 Stand With Us publication. They say, Israel is a sanctuary to the LGBT community. After suffering beatings, imprisonment, and death at the hands of their families and the Palestinian Authority police, many gay Palestinians seek and often find refuge in Israel. While in Israel, they enjoy freedom from persecution. However, Palestinians who illegally enter Israel are subject to deportation. This captures many of the fundamental aspects of pinkwashing. It appropriates queer voices and experiences, especially those of queer Palestinians. It lifts Israel on high to the status of sole savior and refuge, and it places Israel in direct opposition to Palestine as a whole. Importantly, not just the government and the authorities, but also families and communities. It's important to understand what pinkwashing is and what it does, but it's equally important to understand how and why this tactic is effective and compelling. And to do this, we must examine pinkwashing in context. The tactics and rhetorics of pinkwashing aren't brand new. It didn't arise in a vacuum. And to understand it and counter it, we have to examine some of its deeper roots. Pinkwashing itself is a relatively recent development. It first began to come into use around 2001 with a short blog type post on a US-based webpage called Israel 21C. The, the whole purpose of this webpage on their mission statement is producing media that will change the image of Israel abroad. Pinkwashing is the latest development in a long history of colonialism, orientalism, and what I'm going to focus on today, a Western so-called international feminism. Colonial powers have used gendered and sexualized othering in order to justify intervention or involvement on the grounds of a civilizing or a liberating mission. These missions have historically been targeted at saving women in the regions that were objects of colonialist desires. This pattern has been articulated by Gautry Spivak as white, white men saving brown women from brown men, and has, with Orientalist feminism, become white women saving brown women from brown men. And I believe pinkwashing inhabits the same spectrum. Uh, with that, we have white queers saving brown queers from brown society. With pinkwashing, it's a civilized and progressive Israel saving Arab and Muslim queers from their own governments, societies, and even families. In recent memory, First Lady Laura Bush, uh, addressing Americans over the radio on November 17th, 2001, said civilized people throughout the world are speaking out in horror, not only because our hearts break for the women and children in Afghanistan, but also because in Afghanistan we see the world that the terrorists would like to impose on the rest of us. This idea of civilized as, to, as opposed to uncivilized, articulated by the First Lady, gets to the heart of much of this rhetoric surrounding women. In order for these Afghan women to be liberated, they must become like us. They must be brought into civilization. 
And since the US is supposedly among the civilized people of the world, it's our duty to bring this to them. This is very much the same assumption that pinkwashing makes. Palestinian queers and those in the Arab and Islamic worlds more broadly are viewed as objects to be saved by the West. Another example of this long history of a global feminist savior ideology is a play published by a member of the YWCA in 1920, and it was aimed at an American audience. This play said about justifying the involvement of Western women and Western feminism in the Middle East as an absolute necessity for the good of Muslim women. In the play titled A Camel Trip to Cairo, a sheltered Egyptian Muslim girl travels to Cairo with her conservative mother, where she wanders off on her own, is injured in a near miss with a streetcar, and saved by a Western Red Cross nurse who cares for her. By the end of the play, the Western woman has enlightened this girl about the moral implications of wearing or not wearing the veil, the wrongness of spousal abuse, and has also convinced her that she must seek a Western education, which is something that we're led to believe by this play this girl never would have dreamed of if not for the influence of this Western woman. This play was crafted by a member of a group who fundamentally believed in the superiority of their Christian faith and their Western way of life, and felt a need to bring these things to Muslim women in order to save them, both in a religious and a social sense. Although this particular embodiment of Orientalist feminism did not come from a government, it served the interest of colonial powers all the same. This play operated in much the same way that pinkwashing that we see coming from many individuals and smaller, non-directly affiliated with the Israeli government organizations. While it may not have been part of a comprehensive plan developed by the government, uh, something that in pinkwashing's case would be along, along the lines of brand Israel, it's still furthering the cause of Orientalist feminism. It lends itself to a larger body of similar pieces that as a whole get taken as truth, especially when they're so pervasive. That in both cases, these individual efforts arise is just further proof of the prevalence of the ideologies behind them. This complete denial of agency and appropriation of voices and lived experiences is common to pinkwashing and this longer history of Orientalist feminism, and both are born from the assumption of Western superiority. Women and queer people in these targeted societies are not viewed as equals by their Western saviors. They're not even viewed as parts of their own societies, but rather as victims of it. Both of these ideologies rely on a gross oversimplification and reduction of every other part of the objectified people's identities, except for the part being claimed and utilized by the West. There's no room for an intersection of identities in either of these spheres, because they operate on the same Orientalist assumption. The assumption that if you are queer, you cannot be Palestinian. You cannot oppose Israel, the occupation, or the IDF, because as a queer person, they're on your side. They're there to save you. Just as Laura Bush assumes that if you're a woman in Afghanistan, you welcome and even wish for a US invasion to liberate you. Maya Mikdashi summed this up when she wrote, today the promise of gay rights for Palestinians goes something like this. The United States will protect your right not to be detained because you're gay, but will not protect you from being detained because you're a Palestinian. As a queer, you have the right to love and have sex with whomever you choose, safely and without discrimination. But you do not have the right to be unoccupied or to be free from oppression based on your political beliefs, actions, or affiliations. Pinkwashing is not about gay rights, in the same way that Orientalist feminism isn't about the rights of women. In both of these instances, the goal is not to serve the best interests of the objectified people. In order for the targeted women and queers to be saved, they must become Western. They must conform to the Western ideal of a female or a queer subject and embrace the rules and roles of the oppressing power. As I've said before, both Orientalist feminism and pinkwashing separate their targets from any aspects of their identity that are inconvenient to their goals and rhetoric. This erasure of identi identities manufactures a, sep a separation between women and queer Arabs and Muslims respectively and their communities. In the case of pinkwashing, this separation paints a picture of a fundamentally opposed Israeli and Palestinian societies, completely removed from the context of war, occupation, racism, and colonialism. 
This shift in conversation, this shifts the conversation entirely to a civilized and progressive Israel trying to liberate oppressed Palestinian queers from their own people. This shift also happens with feminist Orientalism. And while Laura Bush speaks of the horror of civilized people, she does not speak of the horror of the Afghan women and children that she seems so concerned about the US invasion. She seems so concerned about saving them. She doesn't speak about their horror as the US invasion of their land drags on and on. This shift in focus justifies the occupation, the violence, and the entire colonial project. It's in this way that something that is made to look on the surface like an interest in gay rights or in human rights is just another means of complete colonial domination. Pinkwashing is a tool to this end. It's meant to invoke a false solidarity in Western queer communities with an imagined global queer community, just as Orientalist feminism is meant to invoke a Western-dominated global feminist community. Pinkwashing aims at garnering support for the Israeli settler colonial project, using queer Palestinians as shields to deflect any criticism of Israeli actions. Pinkwashing is not meant to help Palestinian queers. It's not about making their lives better or easier or safer, because at the end of the day, as Stand With Us is so kind to remind us, Palestinians who illegally enter Israel are subject to deportation. As Hanin Maki has said, when you go through a checkpoint, it does not matter what the sexuality of the soldier is, because pinkwashing is not about gay rights. Thank you. Great, thanks Jay. Um, next up is Rachel Byrne. Um, Rachel recently graduated with a master's in women's and gender studies at San Francisco State University and is currently teaching kindergarten literacy in Oakland. While off her paid job, Rachel can be found at the Oakland Queer and Feminist Reading Group, helping with childcare at the Anarchist Book Fair, organizing and participating in work against state violence, including US and Zionist colonialisms and racisms, working on poetry and zines, and challenging patriarchy uh, whenever it happens. Um, this is amazing, I know. Um, so <laughs> Rachel's paper um, is called Pinkwashing and Resistance, Performativity, Complicity, and the Politics of Protest. It's my turn to ask if this is on. And it is. Okay. So before I begin today, I want to recognize that we're on stolen land and that the continuing colonization of this land is very connected to the continuing colonization of the land upon which Israel sits, among others. Um, so um, I will be looking at the 2011 Frameline protest, a protest that I participated in, to look at what anti-pinkwashing resistance looks like and does on the ground. Um, this, the protest was co-sponsored by at least two organizations I work with, just to be really transparent. Um, Queers Undermining Israeli Terrorism, or QUIT, and the International Jewish Anti-Zionist Network, or IJAN. Um, this paper is a space for me to reflect critically upon the work I am doing with others and to put forth critiques and suggestions for use in movements. Um, I've had many discussions with comrades about these critiques, and many of these comrades have had these critiques themselves. So while this paper uses this one protest as an object of analysis, I recognize that there is a lot more on and off the ground work being done around these issues. And this paper is not meant to speak to just this one instance or this one protest or some organization or individuals. So it's more about looking at what um, happened discursively in the protest. Um, instead, I'm trying to disrupt a radical hegemony of tactics that have been used for a really long time and to take a step back and look at what we are actually doing um, when we do this work. Um, so in this paper, I argue that the Frameline protest provided a space for a radical revision of rights and wrongs through performativity and collectivity. However, though a radical site of queer subject formation, this type of resistance can be complicit in settler, settler colonialisms just as it contests occupation. Um, I will look at the Frameline protest to consider the implications of performativity in protest, and I will examine the complicity within anti-apartheid queer dissent um, by locating my archive in the gentrified and colonized Castro, which is in San Francisco. For uh, Probably all of you know that. <laughs> so here we go. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Frameline Film Festival, it is the GLBT film festival in San Francisco and has a really radical history, but has since been neoliberalized. Um, the Consulate of Israel has provided funding for the film festival. It's been listed as a sponsor in the years 2007, 2010, 2011, and 2012, and this year too. Um, each year, queers in the Bay Area have tried to get the funding out of the film festival, and when that hasn't worked, 
um, staged a protest outside the film festival, among other tactics such, such as um, disruptions of, the, of films and um, guerrilla street art by people I don't know. Okay, so the film festival has plenty of funding and the consulate's contribution is meager at best, so it's not based on like a need for that type of funding, it's based on a name. Um, the consulate can pinkwash the festival and win bonus points in San Francisco at the same time. Moreover, um, leaked email correspondence of the Consulate General of Israel and the Executive Director of Frameline shows that the two worked closely to counter the anti-pinkwashing threat posed by Quit and others. So the protest that I'm talking about was against all of that pinkwashing. So um, following Ray Chow's work in the Protestant ethnic and the spirit of capitalism, here I wish to ask, within dissent, to what do we consent? Looking at the rhetoric of language used in the protest through chanting and signage, what does this type of demonstration do? The signs and chants at the protest spoke to apartheid, occupation, and Israeli crimes. To me, these frameworks did not necessarily speak to the history of settler colonialism and risk conflating a colonial analysis into a racialized one, which is also there. Um, moreover, while the protest called for queer BDS, it did not speak to the BDS goal to end colonization in very explicit language. I am, I am that annoying chanter, uh, hopefully not the only one trying to change the notorious chant, free, free, free Palestine, end, end the occupation, to instead say, end, end colonization. Um, same syllables, less compromised message. We need to be careful not to let liberal Zionist discourse leak into our work so that we aren't complicit in Zionism at all. Making things accessible and legible to people shouldn't mean compromising our message and our politics. Um, so some other chants at the protest include, frame line, frame line, shame, 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 no apartheid in our name, and we're angry queers, and we're here to shout, Israeli consulate, get the fuck out. As seen with the use of the word shame and angry, these chants seek to evoke emotion from the chanters to communicate collectivity to the moviegoers. Um, drawing upon a queer history, these emotive utterances subvert common understandings of queerness as part of nationalist sexual exceptionalism. The Frameline protest draws upon a history of sexual exceptionalism to declare, not in my name, as a direct challenge to the regulatory sexualization of liberal citizens. Shame is stripped away from the historic shame of sexuality and applied to the shame of apartheid. Anger is reimagined from sexual violence, stemming from a history of resistance to police repression and the scapegoating of the AIDS epidemic to racialized violence due to uh, apartheid or colonization. Indeed, the use of affect in these chants engages the intersections of queerness and race, posing the challenge of taking on a multi-issue analysis. This resignification challenges the imperial and colonial use of sexuality and the continuation of racism while honoring histories of sexualized oppression. Moreover, this resignification through chanting works performatively, not only literally reiterating itself through repetition, but through drawing upon queer and activist discursive structural ra nope, discursive histories to construct a queer activist collectivity through the demonstration. Discussing the reclamation of the term queer, Judith Butler contends, quote, the public assertion of queerness enacts perform performativity as citationality for the purposes of resignifying the abjection of homosexuality into defiance and legitimacy, end quote, whereby the performative, quote, is less an act, singular and deliberate, than a nexus of power and discourse that repeats or mimes the discursive gestures of power, end quote. By using the activist tool of chanting to refuse to, these, to refer to these histories of colonial and state violence towards queer and colonized peoples, the collective voice produced at the Frameline protest participates in discourse to performatively construct an alternative anti-Israeli apartheid queer collectivity that denounces apartheid in our name. So I want to look at how these tactics may be complicit in the maintenance of gentrification and settler colonialism while at once attempting to challenge the sexualized hegemony of the status quo. What does it mean to have a queer-oriented protest against pinkwashing and the gentrified and colonized Castro? The protest against an international LGBT film festival occurred in the center of one of the fastest gentrifying neighborhoods in San Francisco, the Castro, led by the settling and consumerism of economically privileged white gay men. Gay cis men, right? Gentrification and its collusion with capitalism pushed the Castro from a queered counterpublic to a homonormative tourist space whereby equality and citizenship merits and consumerism trumped, or rather commodified, a history of more radical San Francisco politics of gay liberation. The frameline protest happened in the midst of this gentrification of the Castro without tending to the gentrification, nor challenging the film festival for accepting sponsors that may, film, that may pinkwash structural racism classism in San Francisco. Uh, moreover, the protest did not recognize the parallels between gentrification in the Castro 
and the Israeli colonial military occupation through settler epistemologies and through a material connection between the Israeli government and military and the San Francisco Police Department. Um, these epistemological and material connections tie together the gentrification through urban, urban renewal, building of parks and housing demolition and reconstruction in Israel-Palestine to the gentrification in the Castro and, and that displaced the historically prominent groups of people inhabiting that space. And while I know that like so many of the people in, at that demonstration also organize against gentrification, the separation of these issues is a mistake since they both operate to hold each other up. They are both processes of settler colonialism. Moreover, nonviolent demonstration can risk securing a legitimacy of settler democracy by giving an alibi for its democratic success. The protest facilitation by the San Francisco Police Department, whether or not we asked for it, and their offer of a gated plot of street in which we are allowed to demonstrate discursively secures the image of an operational and legitimate U.S. democracy. Furthermore, the informal permission we received to protest and the subsequent protection from the police erases the violence done by the state through processes such as such as the gentrification of the Castro, thus normalizing this violence rather than contesting it. Here, I mean to trouble a form of homonormativity that not only constructs the neoliberal and depoliticized consumer citizen, but one that subscribes to the normalization of state violence through working with the state or not working actively against it in all spaces um, in activism and protest. <clears throat> To appeal to this type of freedom of speech risks operating through the performative, intentionally or not, to voice a complicit citizenship, creating a subject that is not necessarily homonormative in the traditional sense, but one that nonetheless discursively and citationally colludes with state power. Um, through this complicity, racialized state violence remains reserved for a discussion of Israeli occupation rather than understood in a larger framework of the capitalist and colonial um, illusion of democracy in both spaces and in many other spaces. Um, not only does capitalism's will to consume enable an illusion of democracy, but so does the erasure of ongoing settler colonialism. The myth of a democratic state necessarily depends upon the amnesia of legacies of genocide, ethnic cleansing, and resistance. This amnesia within a movement challenging the settle settlement of another space normalizes settler colonialism by treating a single occurrence of it as exceptional and separate, as if they're not dependent on each other. Thus, the strain of homonormativity expressed through the erasure of gentrification operates through a settler homonationalism as well, whereby the ascendancy of sexuality within struggle normalizes settler inheritance by refusing to confront the racialized and colonial mechanisms underlying expressions of queerness and resistance. As Scott Morganson argues, quote, modern sexuality was not a product of settler colonialism. Thank you as if it came into being in the United States after settlement. Rather, modern sexuality became a method to produce settler colonialism and settler subjects by facilitating ongoing conquest and naturalizing its effects, end quote. In other words, sexuality is an instrument of colonialism rather than a product of it and works to produce modern sexual subjects through the normalization of sexualized conquest. Here at the protest, the invocation of queerness risks normalizing U.S. settler sexual identity as a product of modernization and radicalism, claiming queerness as its own prediscursive identification rather than recognizing and interrupting the process by which sexuality has become a tool of settlement and cultural genocide is in the history of this settler state as well as in Israel. Put another way, while protesting the instrumentalization of sexuality and pinkwashing colonialism, the protest did not necessarily in this space turn the critical lens upon itself to see how sexuality has been and continues to be part of the US colonial apparatus. Um, this narrow focus, addressing a situation rather than a framework of power risks maintaining the epistemological root of settler colonialism. And so in conclusion, what this paper tries to do is not to, not to um, discard tactics or movements or whatever, it's just trying to disrupt something that has become a hegemony of tactics within our organizing and looking at what we are doing on the ground. How can we incorporate an analysis that takes into consideration all of the complicities that hold up what we're actually protesting against, um, rather than um, using a situation that's very dire um, and try to extract it from everything else. So um, Scott Morganson recently wrote this article about bridging alliances between resistance against colonial settler colonialism in Canada and the US with um, resistance to settler colonialisms in Israel. And I think that's where I kind of want to end. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is that it's also 
important to not only make these really physical alliances between organizing, but to make the, to build some bridges between gaps um, that have been made to recognize that there are mutually dependent structures of power that uphold settler colonialism. So thank you. Okay, thanks, Rachel. Um, next, um, uh, Jen Jack Giesking is up. Um, Jack is a cultural geographer and environmental psychologist working on her first book, Queer New York, Lesbians and Queer Women's Geographies of Social and Spatial Justice in New York City, 1983 to 2008. Jack is visiting assistant research professor at the Graduate Center um, of CUNY. Um, she is Jay Giesking on at J. Geese King on Twitter. I don't even know how to say that. Okay. Um, all right. And uh, Jack's paper is called At Home and Abroad from Promised Land to the Land of the Free. Thanks. Thanks, Heather. Okay. So, just have to delete this extra slide that I made to, to kind of block out everything. So I, I, love, I love long titles. I'm an academic. What can I do? So um, the, the part behind the colon uh, is a lesbian queer counter topography of pinkwashing in New York, City tours, New York City's tourism um, and stop and frisk. So I want to uh, jump right in um, to the wear of pinkwashing Israel. These are kind of things that we see from brand Israel. Um, this, on the right is Tel Aviv, the city is hot. And on the left, uh, this is actually an image that Reuters came up with to say how great the business was being. This is Reuters business section, um, 2012. Tel Aviv reveling in gay tourism boom. Um, and I um, had the opportunity to actually go to Israel and uh, be in solidarity with a qualitative methods conference there. I don't know if you know, but there's only about 100 or so folks that do qualitative research in Israel, and it's considered uh, bizarre and weird to do qualitative research. Um, and they were really honored to have uh, other folks come to, to be in conversation with them. Uh, they're really isolated. And, and I wound up working with a lot of people who work with marginalized uh, Palestinian youth, and um, it was really fantastic. And was talking to them about participatory action research, which this is part of. So what's happening in New York, though? So I wound up going there and talking about what's in New York. In 2012, it really weirdly flew under the radar, even though the LGBT center protests were going. Uh, if you don't know about those, uh, the, uh, 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 a member, a board member of the LGBT center of New York uh, is a very pro-Zionist Zionist and had swore by the souls of his grandchildren he would never let anything um, uh, pro-Palestinian happened in the LGBT Center and kicked out uh, a lot of folks. And this led to a, a really long series of protests, about a year. Um, and around the same time, right before the summer came up, this is a mural that appeared in the West Village. Um, who would you want at your wedding? Um, would you like in Iran, homosexual is crime punishable by death. But in Israel, you can get married. It's so great. Um, this was about three blocks south of Christopher Street. In the West Village, uh, 111 Leroy, um, uh, shocking, right? No, no, nobody really talked about it. It was in Queerty, but that, that was it. Um, so I want to say that Israel is, you know, there is, like the, there is the influence in New York City, but there's also what New York City is doing itself. So um, I want to talk to you what came out of my research about pinkwashing, looking back to kind of see what happened before. So my research is from, as I say to straight people to help them understand, from AIDS to the L word. What, what were lesbians and queer women's lives like? Um, so from 1983 to 2008, I talked to a lot of women, and I, I like that real pink image at the, on the right to talk about what happens with pink washing for lesbians and queer women. Um, and uh, uh, my research comes from an urban cultural geography pr uh, approach um, that social space is socially produced. Um, and today, I, I'm going to touch on a lot about scale and the scale of the city. We hear a lot about the nation state of Israel, but uh, we'll be talking about New York. Um, and a counter-topographical approach is something that Cindy Katz, who's a Marxist feminist geographer, came up with uh, to look at very different places and how they're related to one another and to see different practices being deployed. And the practices I want to look at in pinkwashing are, are tourism and, and policing. Um, so my research that I'm, I'm going to draw some quotes from were that I sat down with 47 self-identified lesbians and queer women who came out between 1983 and 2008. We did 22 intergenerational focus groups. They brought mental maps of spaces that were important to them when they were coming out, artifacts from the DIY buttons of the 80s to the plastic gear of the 90s. Uh, and then I also spent uh, about a year in the Lesbian History Archives uh, looking at every 
lesbian organizational record and 25 years worth of publications. And then I put it all online in a follow-up participatory focus group so the women could evaluate my ideas and contribute. So what was happening in New York? So as soon as my research stopped, the Rainbow Pilgrimage was launched. Did you guys hear about the Rainbow Pilgrimage? It was not marketed towards US citizens, so if you probably didn't. This is the, the hopeful future mayor, Christine Quinn, with this is the New York Times article was noted Stonewall anniversary as gay tourism event. The gay pilgrimage was an invitation to folks to come and shop and stay at fancy hotels, see our fantastic architecture. These are rainbow people who I presume probably are white actually um, <laughs> and very rich. Um, uh, and um, this, this is the rainbow pilgrimage. Here's the website. Um, talking about uh, gay NYC and how great it is. And the first thing I thought of was, was Stonewall um, because I think you've heard there were some police there and there's, you know, like, you know, I, um, and we beat up the police, right? This is, a, this is the, the great story of, ref, of refusal and this is the kind of the pinkwashing that came with it. Such raids were commonplace over there in the right during that era due to strong anti-gay bias. It's, that's all gone. It's all great now. And um, <laughs> the enforcement of arcane local laws, which I'll get to another one called Stop and Frisk in a little bit, and the connection that some establishments had with organized crime. So it's not really the gays. It's that they, they had to go to the mafia to, to, to pour them drinks at that time, the only people who get a liquor license. The bar's patrons, perhaps emboldened by the civil rights moment, movement, so, oh, it's a really noble thing. It's a great thing. It's something that's been sanctioned and washed, refused to disperse peacefully, holding a series of protests during the next few days. I, I've read a lot, I think it was a riot, so, but um, just a, a really interesting interpretation that 40 years later this becomes a way that New York City is making money by um, gay people being a police. So what did my participants say about gay pilgrims tour tourism? Was there anything in there to indicate that they thought there was a lot of gay tourism coming to New York. This is what, they, nothing, nothing. They had no idea about this. Um, was, it, was it happening in their lives? Um, they, they really didn't think about it that way. And in fact, um, when I put in nyc.gov and gay visit, uh, in, this is from 2008, um, I got how to get married at the city clerk's office. Um, in 2008, Mayor Bloomberg poured, uh, I think almost a million dollars, over a million dollars, into a renovation of the city clerk's office. Um, the purpose was in 2009 to announce with the, the rainbow pilgrimage and, and uh, hopefully as soon as gay marriage happened that all these international folks would come and get married in New York City, kind of like Las Vegas. And you see up there, there's also a Las Vegas vacation package. So that kind of making New York City the gay marriage capital of the world. So that's the kind of things that are filtering through and happening uh, while I'm doing this research. So uh, just to give you some background about what New York looks like, because I'm going to be mentioning some things, Manhattan in the middle and Brooklyn, Queens in the Bronx. Everybody good there? OK, good. It's good to know that. Um, and this is Judith. So I asked when I did, tourists came up very, and tourism came up very rarely. And I'm going to read this quote. I want to say in talking about the piers and stuff, and the Christopher Street piers are, are off the West Village, it's kind of a, become, um, for over 30, 40, maybe 50 years, the piers were the place to go, especially for queer youth of color um, until around 2004 when they were closed down uh, by the city and very sanitized right when Martha Stewart bought her condo overlooking it. Um, if you want to look up the group Fierce, they, do, they still do a lot of great work about the piers. Um, and the piers were a real kind of queer, gay, lesbian place that people would hang out and have sex and suntan. Um, they were rat infested, they were falling apart, but people loved it there. It was a real home away from home. Um, and this is Jude talking about the piers. She lived in the West Village in the 80s. I want to say in talking about the piers and stuff, kind of during and after the renovation of the piers, I was in another renovation relationship and my partner lived on and still lives on Hudson and 12th. And so we would walk along the piers all the time, right? Just a whole great mix of people. But it was the tourists who were annoying assholes. And everyone laughed in the focus group. <laughs> they would be homophobic, right? I would say, just go home. You don't belong here because this is our space, you know? Of course, I wouldn't say that to them. But I would be bitching and complaining. Really, that's how I felt. Um, and so the, the idea that there is a gay tourism meeting up with gay life uh, in, in, I mean that in a broad way, in an LGBTQ way, excuse me, it's early, um, uh, is, is, is missing and absent. So the other way that, this is Jude, uh, Judith's map, um, 
of, of lesbian and queer spaces in New York City, and it's just a big absence. Um, and so this big kind of gay pilgrimage and this big tourism, this is Manhattan on the left and Brooklyn on the right, that's her whole world. Uh, she goes back and forth every day. Um, but uh, you see the Lesbian History Archives, there's two bars, there's the LGBT Center, and, and that's it. Um, so what about policing? So in uh, 2009, I think it started, 2010, um, the New York City Police started a little thing called Stop and Frisk, which you might have heard of. It's on trial for the last two weeks and will be for a little bit longer. Um, and what's really important here, this is a survey that the uh, Welfare Warriors Research Collective did with a over 100 low-income youth of color. And those who were... Who, who, took, who said that they were stopped and frisked within the last two years um, were, were, I mean, it's just a drastic, painful number of more people receiving sexual attention, getting a ticket, being arrested, and being physically assaulted. Um, and then there was another survey, I think, of over, I, I'm not sure of the number, but I know it's a few hundred uh, low-income youth of color who were uh, asked if they were stopped and frisked, and 47% and, and were in the last two years. So this disproportionately affects youth of color, queer youth of color, um, and queer youth. Um, this I just want to show you, which I'm not going to show you. Sorry, you're going to have to look it up on your own. <laughs> Such a tease. I do love a video, though. Um, uh, so I want to talk about how my, uh, my participants experience policing. Uh, this is Trey. Uh, um, I should say that Judith was, is white and um, in her 50s. Trey is in her 20s uh, and West Indian. And she says people were like, yeah, our community is in my neighborhood. And they were talking about food co-ops and the building community. And I'm like, what the fuck? What the fuck is community? I know where and what community is. It's the West Indian community. We've got policing. And now there's more pigs to protect you. So is my gayness the first issue? Hmm, no, I'm repressed because of my gayness, you know, making fun of the people she experienced in her focus group. But in that room, they were putting a zet with zet, period, no hyphen, no semicolon. Hmm. Um, and very quickly, this is Trey's map. And when I asked her to draw a map of lesbian and queer spaces, she actually lives to the east of this map, but she only drew Park Slope and Prospect Heights where there's a huge amount of, of whiteness and middle, rich, uh, liberal, uh, um, the you know, double wide stroller life, because um, that's where she can be gay. But to the right, she can be black, and she splits those in her life. So I wanted to talk about just very quickly to end pinkwashing in the city. So what I hope today to do is, I don't, I don't think we need a new term. I put homo urbanism in there to kind of be funny. But to think about homo nationalism is we're really stuck on the nation state. And I think um, pinkwashing is, is a practice and a process that's happening, happening at different scales and affecting a lot of people in different ways. Um, and the pinkwashing is not a process specific to the nation state, but it's getting deployed at other scales. And to think about it as, as part of neoliberalism deployed through racism and capitalism and sexism. And it's also being closely aligned with the creative class thesis. Um, if you get more gays and artists into your city, uh, you'll have more money. Uh, that's what Richard Florida sells to cities like Philadelphia with their brotherly love campaign. So it's not only a response to homo-nationalism, but a response to urbanism and, and things happening at different scales. And I hope that maybe when we start to look at different scales, we can find kind of fissures and gaps uh, for resistance and moving forward. And uh, last but not least, I, I wanted to say I did look up brand Israel lesbian. And this was really shocking to me that there's the only images that come up are, that are lesbians are Judith Butler and Sarah Schulman. <laughs> now, to think that... This is <laughs> right. To think that this is be this is a very gendered campaign as well, and I, I wanted to you know remind you that on the last image, um, and uh, uh, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, next up is um, Jennifer Kelly. Jennifer Kelly is a fourth year PhD candidate in the Department of American Studies at the University of Texas at Austin with a portfolio in women's and gender studies. Her dissertation is titled, Your Work is Not Here, Solidarity, Tourism, and Occupied Palestine. And she recently returned from fieldwork in Palestine as a Palestinian American Research Center Fellow. She's currently in the second stage of her dissertation research, conducting US-based interviews with Solidarity Tour alumni. Um, Jennifer's talk today is called Pinkwashing, Tourism, and Anti-Colonial Resistance. Thank you. Can you hear me? OK. 
Uh, Israeli state-sanctioned attempts to brand Israel as a gay celebratory space hinge on notions of unfettered mobility for both its LGBT citizens as well as for gay tourists. At the same time, these branding endeavors have proliferated. The state of Israel has increasingly worked to restrict the mobility of Palestinians. In this paper, I place these celebrations of LGBT mobility in Israel within the same analytic frame as the Israeli state's restrictions on Palestinian movement. I use tourism as a lens to better understand the disjunctures between mobility and immobility in the context of Israel-Palestine, and I argue that while Palestinian solidarity tours may not explicitly address gay tourism or Israeli pinkwashing campaigns, which laud Israel's gay rights advances in order to deflect attention away from its human rights violations, they disrupt the logic of pinkwashing and the simultaneous logic of mobility by using the mobility of internationals to highlight the immobility of Palestinians. In this paper, I will provide a brief overview of recent Israeli gay tourist initiatives, tracing the ways in which these interpolations to potential gay tourists pivot on the question of mobility. I will then describe the content of solidarity tours and show how Palestinian organizers expose the fragmented landscape and the impossibilities of their movement by taking tourists to places where they themselves cannot go. I will explore what the transfer of tourists between Palestinians and their international and Israeli allies reveals about the fracturing of the West Bank and the severing of Palestinian communities from one another. Finally, I will ask, what can we gain from having a capacious understanding of responses to pinkwashing? What does it mean to resist the logic of pinkwashing while not explicitly addressing questions of gay rights? Lastly, if we understand Israeli PR campaigns to be using gay rights as a diversion tactic, then in what ways does changing the conversation from questions of LGBT advances to questions of freedom of movement actually allow us to refocus our attention on practices that expose, negotiate, and resist the processes of settler colonialism? The recent attempts to market, gay tele, or market Tel Aviv as a gay hotspot have been organized, varied, well-funded, state-sanctioned campaigns that treat the branding of Tel Aviv as a gay tourist destination as a top priority. These campaigns traffic in a sustained emphasis on borderlessness and queer multicultural mobility. They interpolate gay tourists to use this, quote, cultural and social oasis of Tel Aviv as a jumping off point for all of Israel inviting gay tourists to explore Jerusalem, the Dead Sea, Haifa, and Masada. It, of course, bears emphasizing that, save for arbitrary exception dictated by Israelis' moods, West Bank Palestinians do not have access to the Dead Sea, located in the occupied West Bank, and unless they possess an exceedingly rare permit, they do not have access to Jerusalem. These invitations tell gay tourists staying in Tel Aviv that they will be in startling proximity to every place they would want to travel. Their mobility is constructed as unparalleled. As the Gay Tel Aviv Guide puts it, Within one to two hours drive, you can be in magical tourist sites during the day and easily return to Tel Aviv to catch a party at night. These invitations are predicated on the question of mobility, proximity, and particularly on images of borderlessness and open access to everywhere and every kind of world, religious, magical, historical, relaxing, indulgent, and of course, gay. Borderlessness is similarly performed every time a tourist bus from Israel travels to Bethlehem or the Dead Sea. Unlike Palestinians or tourists traveling from the West Bank into Jerusalem via Checkpoint 300 in Bethlehem or Kalandia Checkpoint in Ramallah, Israeli tour buses coming into the West Bank enter no checkpoint. Tourists show no passports, they see no armed guards. The wall opens up for them to let the bus through, allowing them to believe they have simply just been to Israel. Many scholars and activists, among them Jasper Poir, Sarah Shulman, Hanin Maiki, and Judith Butler, have recently centered these types of celebrations of Israeli LGBT possibility in Israel as part of the state-sanctioned effort to brand Israel as an exceptionally democratic, tolerant, multicultural, and cultured sanctuary in light of increasingly vociferous and organized critiques of Israeli human rights violations. Palestinians are... Uh, or many scholars have also written recently about the extent to which Israel represents Palestinians as irreparably homophobic in efforts to shore up its self-representation as a gay paradise. While much scholarship has unpacked the strategies of pinkwashing, I am more interested in its logic. Its logic maintains that Israel is a space of unrestricted mobility. Within this logic, gayness moves from secluded and circumscribed enclaves of LGBT life to unfettered access to everywhere, including spaces of occupation and exclusion like the Dead Sea and a safe return home to Tel Aviv. Within this logic, Israel becomes the guarantor of freedom of movement for gays, and by extension, tolerance of gays becomes a barometer for progress. Israel advances a just-like-you narrative to Europeans and Americans in terms of its commitment to democracy and freedom of expression. I'm interested in what constitutes a response to this logic. While activist approaches have varied from tendencies to point out Israel's moments of homophobic hostility, to de debunk its attachment to democracy, to critique stressing and excoriating the co-opting and the hard-won rights of the Israeli gay community in the service of settler colonialism, 
I ask what happens if we recenter the occupation and the contours of settler colonialism in this discussion, as many scholars and activists are calling for, and focus for a moment on the question of mobility itself. I turn now to the question of immobility in the occupied West Bank. Drawing from ethnographic fieldwork in Israel-Palestine, I argue that the civil society call across the West Bank for tourists to come and see Palestine underscores the restriction of Palestinian movement in the context of ongoing Israeli settler colonialism. Solidarity tourism is largely comprised of organized tours ranging from day tours to week-long tours that invite internationals to visit Palestine, to witness the effects of Israeli occupation in the West Bank, and to learn about the contours of life under occupation from Palestinians themselves. Stressing international complicity with Israel's occupation, organizers rely on a tenuous politics of hope that their audience, tourists that range from curious backpackers to committed activists, will do something with what they have witnessed upon return to their respective countries. Tourists experience a version of restriction of movement and access from the moment they arrive at Ben Gurion International Airport in Tel Aviv. They know that if they announce they're going to Palestine, if they have an Arab last name, if they're Muslim, if they have family or friends in Palestine, if they've spent time in predominantly Muslim countries, they will be subject to a lengthy interrogation and possibly not let in. Palestinian guides and organizers have recently collaborated to call attention to the res this restriction of visitors, inaugurating the Welcome to Palestine campaign, or Flytilla, referencing the flotillas that have attempted to break the siege on Gaza where an international activist fly to Ben-Gurion and declare that they're going to Palestine. These activists are not in the country and often are not allowed to even board Israel-bound planes in their home countries. Here, restrictions on movement are simultaneously restrictions on movement building. Highlighting the militarized police state of surveillance control, restriction of movement, and bars against being visited, Palestinian organizers ask, even prisoners are allowed to have visitors, why can't we? If allowed in the country, tourists will seek out the unannounced, unnamed guide waiting for them and travel typically to Bethlehem. There they will witness the disjuncture between the scores of tourists from Israel filing into the Church of Nativity and the nearby towering wall severing Palestinians from land that used to be theirs. They might also see Beit Jalla, where Israeli-only roads connecting settlements bisect and trisect Palestinian land. They then make the journey to nearby, but for many Palestinians a world away, Jerusalem, Explaining this disjuncture to me, one tour guide said, I can see Jerusalem from where I'm standing, but I can get to Copenhagen easier than I can get to Jerusalem. The way West Bank Palestinian guides and organizers negotiate this movement of international travel or international tourists from Bethlehem to Jerusalem is entirely contingent on either a trade-off on the other side of Checkpoint 300 after tourists walk through on foot or by having an international volunteer or organizer take the group for the day. Here, tourists understand that their Palestinian guide, who has facilitated their movement around the Bethlehem area thus far, cannot go with them. Tourists walk through the labyrinthine corrals of the checkpoint and wave their international passport in front of the bulletproof glass while the Palestinians next to them have to show their wrinkled permits, their ID cards, and place their fingers in the scanner for biometric screening. On the other side of the checkpoint, the internationals have a new guide for the day and they make their way to Jerusalem. On guided political tours through the old city, tourists see armed civilian settlers, settlers armed bodyguards in plain clothes, groups of heavily armed young soldiers on every corner, home settlers have taken over in the greats above Palestinian markets to catch the trash settlers throw. After this, they file onto a bus to hear a thorough and detailed explanation of Israeli apartheid in East Jerusalem and witness its effects, from the lack of infrastructure and unpaved roads in East Jerusalem to the wall cutting through Abu Dis and severing the route that had long served as a thoroughway from Jerusalem to Jericho. Standing near a Palestinian gas station, reading the anti-occupation graffiti on the wall, situated in a Palestinian community severed from their former neighbors and their family across the wall, tourists take in the last thing they see of Jerusalem before going back to their Palestinian guides and organizers on the other side of the wall. Guides and organizers force a confrontation with the restriction of mobility within the West Bank as well. Tourists leave with their guides from Beit Sahur and travel slowly to Hebron, passing settlement after sprawling settlement. Sometimes the bus attempts to he enter Hebron through a settlement, a faster route into the city in lieu of trying to maneuver the winding tiny streets for Palestinians to access their homes. At these moments, the Palestinian guide may attempt to blend in with an international, as allowing the bus driver to negotiate with the Israeli soldier guarding the entrance to the settlement to let the bus of just tourists in. In these moments, tourists are visibly aware of the arbitrary politics of identification in these contact zones, the extent to which entrance is contingent on not looking Arab, the extent to which all mobility is at someone else's discretion. Once in the city, there are several moments during which the guides cannot accompany the tourists. Tourists walk down Shahada Street alone, for example, which was once a bustling marketplace, a street so busy one guide told the tourist he used to have to hold hands with his father in order to not get lost in the bustling marketplace. 
Chada Street is now closed to Palestinians, even the one who still managed to live on the street and have to enter the homes from the back, who have cages around their, their patios to protect them from debris settlers throw, who have signs in their windows reading, you are witnessing apartheid. They take in Chihada Street always walking slowly, always shocked, rarely seeing anyone else since it has become a ghost town. A thoroughfare through the city closed off to the 177,000 Palestinians who love, live in Hebron with access only to tourists, the 500 settlers who live there, and the 1,500 to 2,000 soldiers who protect them. Here, tourists alone, thank you, witness some of the more than 400 stores that have been closed under military orders, some of the almost 2,000 others that closed due to all the closures and checkpoints, and some of the more than 1,000 empty Palestinian homes. They find their way from one checkpoint to another, walking through the vacant street, reading the signs in Palestinian families' windows, imploring them to understand what they're witnessing. Once tourists leave the final checkpoint, they're walking apartheid, a street solely for them, while Palestinians file onto a street one-eighth of the size of the one they're walking on, having to go through another checkpoint and another, searched at every stop. Tourists leave Hebron, assuming their guides aren't detained at the checkpoint, with a tangible understanding of their freedom of mobility and awareness of the restriction of mobility of Palestinians at every turn. They also understand the way in which their mobility is tied to the lack of proximity with Palestinians. If soldiers guarding checkpoints to the settlement, for example, know they have a Palestinian guide, they might not be let in. This precarity and contingency of movement is set in sharp contradistinction to the image Israel puts forth in invitations to station oneself in Tel Aviv as a jumping off point for the entire country, a home base from which to explore what Israel has to offer. Here I wonder what it would mean to see solidarity tourism, LGBT and otherwise, as an embodied response to pinkwashing. What does it mean to strategize against the logic of an initiative, the underlying understanding that visiting Israel is an exercise in the freedom to do, see, move, experience, live freely, express yourself without restraint, kiss your partner in public, have unfettered access to consume everything without explicitly addressing or defining that initiative? What does it mean to centralize the question of freedom of movement in the collective struggle to define and resist settler colonialism in Israel-Palestine? To what extent does centralizing immobility avoid the pitfall of having the conversations on the terms set by the pinkwashing campaigns, the question of LGBT advances, gay rights, modernity, liberalism, and gay visibility as a, pro as a barometer for progressive politics? Here I wonder what we gain from exploring the notion that solidarity tourism, in spite of all of the limitations of tourism as a vehicle for activism, is materially debunking the central premises of pinkwashing that divert the conversation away from qu the question of settler colonial military occupation and onto the question of gay rights. Solidarity tourism instead wants to showcase colonialism, reveal restrictions on mobility, and force a confrontation between tourists and what they think they know about Israel-Palestine. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Next up is Tali Ben Daniel, um, who is a PhD candidate in cultural studies at the University of California, Davis. Her dissertation, dissertation um, entitled Branding Israel, Queer Markets and Politics in San Francisco, traces the way narratives about queer identity in San Francisco inform Israeli nation branding campaigns. And um, her talk is Capitalism and Gay Identity, Branding Israel in San Francisco. I'm gonna do it from here, because the thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you uh, very much, Heather, and I wanna thank the conference organizing committee uh, for a really fantastic conference and a really amazing conversations I've been having yesterday and today. Um, my talk is titled Capitalism and Gay Identity, which I shamelessly stole from John, John D'Amelio's work, um, but it gestures towards my lar the larger argument of my dissertation. Uh, which is that the incorporation of homosexuality into the nation is through capitalist success, consumerism, and gay entrepreneurship. So we can't talk about pinkwashing without talking about capitalism. So um, this paper uh, out argues that the use of gay rights in the Brand Israel campaign works to advertise Israel as a safe space not just for gay people, but for foreign investment. So first, I will show how historically gay politics in San Francisco are inseparable from gay capitalism, um, which actually Rachel illustrated really well in her talk um, on this panel. Um, and then second, I will draw a connection between the Castro and Israel through their similar settler logics. Third, how those settler logics influenced the ways tolerance became an indicator for investment risk, um, which Jack gestured towards in their talk. Um, and finally, I will argue that this shows how brand Israel is mobilizing tolerance for further financial investment in Israel. 
So we've collectively begun to analyze Israeli branding tactics by naming them pinkwashing. And we tend to think of it working in the following way. Israel commits atrocities against Palestinians via the occupation, and in order to cover it up and win the hearts and minds of gay people, Israel paints a gloss of gay rights over those atrocities. Um, and this can take many forms from promoting Tel Aviv as a gay destination to claiming that gay Palestinians prefer Israel to Palestine. And the problem I have with this analysis is that it implicitly claims that Israel's goal in branding Israel is to divert attention away from the occupation. And rather, I argue that Israeli nation branding is an attempt to attract financial capital and political capital to Israel, even with a highly visible occupation. So I'm going to use Blue Star PR, which is a pro-Israel advocacy nonprofit based in San Francisco, as an example throughout my talk. But as I think we saw in the panel, there are many more examples that we could work with. Um, they were working actually well, well before the brand Israel Group coalesced in the early part of the 2000s. And they saw themselves as responding to the ways Israel was losing the image war in the gay community, by which they um, explicitly referenced quit, which Rachel um, talked about in her talk. So this was seen as a response to Quit's tactics. So the story we tell about gay urban identity in the United States, particularly in San Francisco, tends to follow a trajectory. Closeted rural gay people move to the city, and once the community is formed, they transform the city into something more beautiful than it was before. Um, and I want to point to a phrase in the second paragraph of this postcard. It was given out in San Francisco Pride by Blue Star PR, um, the San Francisco of the Middle East. This phrase redefines Tel Aviv as a gay space, and by doing so, Tel Aviv is not only the liberated utopia for those trapped in homophobic spaces, but also becomes the tolerant and secure place for financial investment. And it's tempting to think of Blue Star's work as another way that queer politics are co-opted by capitalism. But in order to effectively analyze this, we actually have to let go of our traditional understandings of gay politics as once radical, now colonized by capitalism. Instead, we have to acknowledge that there isn't a historical moment where gays and lesbians were not incorporated into capitalism in some meaningful way. So what we tend to do is we tend to think of there was milk at the, the San Francisco rally as a sort of like radical moment in San Francisco gay politics. And then we have this ad for cores, which is like the appropriation of gay politics, and that gives us something like Blue Star PR and Brand Israel, right? Um, when we examine San Francisco as an example, we see that the economic activities of a visible gay male population in San Francisco in the 1970s led to the development of a gay market that collapsed gay consumption with gay politics. These activities were at times straightforwardly economic, like the formation of business associations, but were also social organizations that were often deemed political. They created a discourse of marketability. Gay friendly became code for being consumable, marketable, and good for profit. In the context of nation branding, what constitutes a safe investment is not merely a matter of economics, but also incorporates cultural matter. So in other words, these three moments actually lead into each other rather than constituting a break, right? So in the 1970s, the Castro Village Association, founded by Harvey Milk, worked to market the Castro as a neighborhood transformed from its former drab self into a safe, beautiful shopping district. The CVA decentered the gay bar as the singular business of gay social life. Rather, the transformation as what was formerly known as the Eureka Valley into the Castro was an attempt to build an alternative economic world, where gay businesses included bookstores, gift shops, and laundries, and catered to straight customers as well. The CVA published a series of shopper's guides directed at straight San Franciscans. The first guide, published in 1974 entitled All Eyes Towards Castro Village, advertises the pleasant changes visitors could experience in the Castro Village. So this description marks the neighborhood as an attractive place for middle class consumption, a shopper's district rather than a purely residential neighborhood. Gifts, plants, and such aesthetics signal an appreciation for domestic beauty and self-expression, which fits the larger branding effort of the CVA had in mind, that decor-minded gaze reinvented and cleaned up the neighborhood. So the branding of the Castro was particularly successful because of the use of settler logics and particularly civilizing narratives of beautification and the productive use of land. So Randy Schultz, who wrote the biography of um, Harvey Milk, the mayor of Castro Street, his description of the Castro summarized this narrative. 
So this is him now. Um, the trend that most caught the eye of San Francisco was the massive facelift Gates gave to a neighborhood that had been generating into an eyesore. The endless rows of Victorians had been a little more than tract housing when they were built in the 1880s. To the Irish who stayed in the neighborhoods until the 1970s, they were just old houses. Unburdened by a homebody wife and 2.2 children, the gay immigrants started an unprecedented wave of private urban renewal. Block after block of high Italian, Italian Edwardian homes burst forth in polychromatic splendor. So this story about what happened to the Castro after the influx of gay residents became the cornerstone of understanding gay neighborhoods in the context of urban life. Since at least 1973, but perhaps earlier, gay male property ownership signified private urban renewal, gentrification, citizenship, and capital. And while gay men and some women actually had somewhat limited access to property, uh, with most residents in the Castro renting, the discourses of property ownership had much larger repercussions for the ways the gay community, as it were, was seen in taxonomies of human value. And the myth of gay urban renewal mimics the logics of settler citizenship. According to Scott Lorraine Morganson, in order for settlerism to work, settlers must naturalize their presence on the land as rightful. And regardless of their relationship to the land's former inhabitants, settlers, quote, turn native land and culture into an inheritance, granting them ownership and knowledge of themselves. So the gay marketing narrative of urban regeneration after moving to the city to, to escape persecution elsewhere is an iteration of the settler narratives of the United States. The early colonists, persecuted for who they were in their homelands, make a new utopic world elsewhere. In addition, the Zionist aim to make the desert bloom, a reference to Israeli agriculture and pioneerism, and always includes the lack of care that Arabs and Palestinians took of the land, resonates with the settler logics of urban pioneerism and transformation in the Castro. So the act of settlement is justified by the use they make of the land by civilizing, productive, or beautifying transformations. The settler language that encodes much of the discussion of gay property ownership in this era includes narratives of displacement for the poor or for people of color. This quote, um, which appeared in a 1978 Business Week article, blames the destruction of the largely black Fillmore district in the Western edition on the development of gay neighborhoods in San Francisco. In truth, it was the San Francisco Redevelopment Agency itself that raised the Fillmore, including an established business center and over 2,500 Victorian homes, all in the name of urban renewal, with the promise of new affordable housing that was never built. But gay neighborhoods became the scapegoats for redevelopment more broadly, in part due to the neoliberalization of urban renewal in the 1970s. There was a resurgence of property-based legislation in California that simultaneously expanded the power of redevelopment agencies while privatizing urban renewal strategies, um, including something called the Urban Homesteading Program, where people could apply to buy houses and they, the city would basically give them a house if they lived in it for three years and built it and like refurbished it, right? Um, but the narrative of gay gentrification is a really attractive one, not just because of settlerism, but because of neoliberalism as well. Neighborhoods are being improved by gay residents as a result of their political convictions or natural self-expression, or both. Um, they don't need the kinds of incentives that the urban homesteaders do, or nor is there any obvious state intervention. In a neoliberal context, the beautification of gay neighborhoods added to gay value and cemented the relationship between capitalism and gay identity. So, um, as Jack pointed out, the discourses of gay gentrification are clearly at work in the theories of Richard Florida, one of the unacknowledged inspirations for Israeli nation branding. Florida's work uses the presence of gay neighborhoods within a city as a marker of tolerance and argues that tolerance is one of the key factors in investment strategies. So partly advice for cities hoping to attract corporations and capital and partly research into what he terms the creative class, um, this book, uh, published, um, spawned a multitude of urban policies, corporate philosophies, and a consulting firm that Florida Helms titled the Creative Class Group. So in my research, I found several documents suggesting that the Brand Israel Group wants to showcase Tel Aviv's creative energy and is directly inspired from this thesis. So um, despite a lot of critique, Thank you. Um, his ideas remain incredibly popular, in part because they fit in so well with a neoliberal view of urban economies. This is a deeply privatized and individualized understanding of how urban spaces operate. So San Francisco serves as the model for the ideal creative city, both because of the success of Silicon Valley and because of its highly visible gay community. According to Florida, because many high-tech workers are socially awkward, foreign-born, 
from elsewhere or have extreme habits or dress. They look for tolerant places to live and work. Florida quotes Gary Gates as saying that the gay community is the canary of the creative age. In other words, openness to homosexuality is an indicator of low entry barriers to human capital. <sighs> I know. In an economic brief written in 2004, Florida's theories were used to explain why the Middle East is resistant to economic development. Written by Peterson Fellows, Marcus Noland, and Howard Pack, Islam, Globalization, and Economic Performance in the Middle East argues that the public attitudes towards foreigners of globalization impede economic development. In other words, the economic problems of one of the most repeatedly colonized areas of the world can be explained away as an attitude problem. <laughs> to define cultural antagonism to Globalization, the authors looked at the 2002 Pew Global Attitudes Poll and selected questions they saw as having particularly high correlations with measures of risk and economics exchange, especially foreign direct investment. One of the questions which the participants had to agree or disagree with was homosexuality should be accepted by society. Citing Florida's claim that the homosexual population is the single best predictor of high technology industry, the authors claim, as you can see in this quote, that increasing the tolerance of homosexuality would increase investment in the Middle East. So in this light, we see Israeli nation branding projects using settler logics encoded in gay neighborhoods to brand Tel Aviv as a gay space. And in doing so, showcase how their tolerance of homosexuality might indicate that Tel Aviv is a low risk place open to investment. Um, and once we understand these linkages, pinkwashing emerges as a tactic that exploits the already established historical links between capitalism and gay identity. Um, this allows us to think past uh, this idea that pinkwashing is about a question of representation, that like there's some kind of inaccurate representation of Israel and Palestine happening, um, and necessitates us, us ask and necessitates us asking hard questions about complicity, queer settler colonialism, and models of resistance. And further, I want to suggest that these conne connections might clarify why boycott, divestment, and sanctions, particularly the cultural boycott, is actually a very effective and productive tactic. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. All right, um, our final um, uh, presentation before we uh, open it up for discussion is um, by Darnell Moore. Darnell L. Moore is a writer, educator, and activist. He's worked in the fields of youth development for more than a decade and has been active in queer organizing in communities of color over the past several years. He was appointed the inaugural chair of the City of Newark's LGBTQ Concerns Advisory Commission and was a member of the first US LGBTQ delegation to Palestine in 2012. He is presently a visiting fellow at the Institute for Research in African American Studies at Columbia, um, and he's also a board member of CLAGS, and he is excited that CLAGS is co-hosting this conference. Um, so Darnell's um, paper is called Reflections on LGBTQ Youth Homelessness, Same-Sex Marriage Advocacy, Same-Sex Marriage Advocacy and Pinkwashing, um, Brown Bodies Covered in Pink. Thank you. Someone should have told me not to drink water before I had to do it. <laughs> Lord, get me for this. I'm really happy to be here. I begin with a story about endings, or rather, the beginning of a rather complicated narrative, briefly outlining a process of willful, purposeful forgetting. It is a story of queer and trans youth of color whose life, world, and subjectivities are pushed to the peripheries of a mostly cisgendered gay and lesbian movement centered on adult centered can you not hear me? just a little close oh close. yeah yeah you're getting too bad say it again just a little close to your mouth oh can you all hear me yeah. oh <laughs> it's the water <laughs> so it's a story of queer and trans youth of color whose life worlds and subjectivities are pushed to the peripheries of a gay and lesbian movement centered on adult rights priorities, and privileges. The story of an uncompromising, racialized, masculinist, ageist, ableist, and classist queer center that spins on an axis of power while the black and brown and young and disabled and poor are willfully and purposefully displaced and forgotten. A narrative of so-named progress that is nothing more than a quest 
towards, to borrow Lisa Duggan's appropriate intervention, the homonormative. The story of young queer and trans folk I know, like Riddell, for example. Riddell is in the US on asylum from his hometown in Jamaica. He is multiply homeless as a non-citizen living in the US and as an asylum seeker who cannot return to the nation state that subjugated him. He shares space in a rooming house in one of five boroughs. It is a space that he cannot afford. Who wills to remember him? Which lesbian and gay, and I'm using that specifically because we tend to not focus on bisexual and transgender folk, advocacy platform is organized to ensure his well-being, to ensure that he, that he doesn't have to reluctantly engage various alternative economies to survive. Which shade of pink has blurred his brown? In what follows, I wish to briefly elucidate the interconnections between pinkwashing, lesbian and gay, adult-centered movements, namely the quest for marriage equality here in New York State, and the plight of homeless and multiply marginalized queer and trans youth of color. I ultimately want to disrupt the master narrative, pun is unintended, and offer counter narratives, readings which might help us to one, draw the connections between transnational queer movements taking place in solidarity with Palestinians who live under occupation, Two, interrogate the ways in which socio-political technologies of oppression like pinkwashing are indeed instantiated in geopolitics and conceals other types of occupations practiced by domestic systems within the US settler colonial state and our civil society. And lastly, to encourage remembrance. That is to recall and name the marginalized among us and the ways in which they are often invisibilized and muted even among queer campaigns of so-called so progression and anti-pinkwashing. So I begin with a few thoughts on the de degenerative progression in the case of the lesbian and gay movement in, the New, in New York State, specifically. Progressives and neoconservatives alike cite the Empire State's Marriage Equality Act as a case for New York's movement in the direction of social, social demo democratic ideas and advanced policies, citing and making policymaking since its ratification in June 2011. Some contend that the state of New York, like the other eight states with similar same-sex marriage laws, serves as the nation's laudable example of rhetorical fairness, equity, justice, and dare I say human rights as they relate to LGBTQ constituents. The Marriage Equality Act has become the cause celebre of New York-based and national gay rights activists ostensibly distracting the state citizenry from centering on policies, practices and legislations that further concretize a lack of rights, freedoms, access, power, and safety in the lives of multiply marginalized queer and trans people, especially economically disenfranchised youth of color. And while I've never deemed myself a seer, that is someone who can see into the future, I do predict that the passage of the Marriage Equality Act will result in a localized posture and practice of pinkwashing in the near future, if not now. A term, as noted throughout this conference, has been generally taken up by pro-Palestinian activists to illuminate and critique the Israeli government's emphasis on state sanctions granted to its LGBTQ citizens. Pinkwashing, as I'm using it here, describes a liberalist method used to distract Israeli citizens from their complicity in international human rights injustices, like the ongoing occupation of the West Bank and the stronghold on Gaza. Yet I foresee the days, indeed, we are living in them, when pinkwash politics will be played out similarly, localized in the state of New York, perpetuating the hyper-invisibility of the bodies and the material conditions in the lives of certain marginalized folk in New York, while overly illuminating so-called LGBTQ progress. In response, we will need an intersectional analytical framework to assess the extent to which marriage equality is used to render policies and practices illegible that harm multiply marginalized queers. Indeed, we need a framework that illuminates the potential complications of marriage equality advocacy, which now seems to fun function as a type of brush that is often used to paint a picture of progression as a means to cover the material consequences of structural oppression and the ways it makes legible representations of the queer adult struggling to access rights, even while rendering illegible those whose lives counter the very logics of rights and privilege, namely the young, the black, the brown, the poor, and the homeless. 
And I should note at this point in my, in my remarks that I'm elated that my home state's governing body has provided the civil marriage option for those who wish to, who, who wish to partake in it. Those who wish to be afforded the same 1,324 rights granted to married couples in our state. Indeed, the passage of this landmark legislation is no small feat. Yet, I'm of the opinion, as poignantly articulated by some queer and feminist scholar activists like Rich Blint and Lisa Duggan and so many others, that civil marriage is but of one option that should be made available to those who desire the state's qualification of and benefit towards their relationships. And as many feminist and queer activists have argued before me, I contend that the sole focus of some LGBT advocates and straight allies on a reified institution of marriage as a chief arrangement among intimate partnerships situated along the moral hierarchy above civil unions, domestic partnerships, and other forms of non-married, non-monogamous relationship formations is myopic and dangerously so. But the singular investment, capital, ide ideological, and corporeal in gay marriage advocacy work short circuits the emancipatory potential of a queer politic, praxis, and public policy platform that seeks the overall destabilization of any such institution, real or imagined, which furthers state-sanctioned, heteronormed, patriarchal, and neoliberal modes of relationality. Such institutions, which are, si are sustained by way of state policies, disqualify other modes of being. Queer politics emerge in response to such a, in, in response to anti-assimilationist posturing. Indeed, uh, Kathy Cohen suggests a trajectory of queer activism that moves in a direction of anti-assimilationist and transform, transformational coalition work. The, the radical queer work then is one of demolishing the institutions, the walls, both physical as in the case of the walls continually fortified within a state within Israel-Palestine and those ide ideological legal walls built within the US that otherwise seek to constrict us. Yet for what it's worth, we will have our 1,324 rights, should we want them, even if that means a homonormativization of marriage as the end result, the many lived experiences of diverse ways that queer people orient ourselves in the world and in our bedrooms, our varied forms of intimacy and relating will be disappeared under the guise of gay marriage. And that, I'm afraid, will be but another form of peak wash politics. Black queer writer and activist Kenyon Farrell posed the following questions in response to the politics governing the support of marriage equality in the state of New York. Quote, what does it mean when progressives celebrate a victory in large part won by GLP supporting hedge fund managers? T pun funders and corporate conglomerates, end quote. Farrell's important question is cause for serious contemplation in a year and several months post celebration among gay rights workers. The ideological slippages and leaps that were made and will be made to ensure that an agenda centered on normalizing the gay married couple, the family, will surely trouble the necessary queer work that remains to be done, as Farrell similarly contends in the areas of urban education, immigration and prison reform, women's rights, economic justice, environmental justice, etc. And I doubt that it would haunt many of the organizations and individuals, lesbian, gay, or straight, for whom access, rights, and privileges as granted per their privileged social and economic locations are primary positions of concern. Maybe that's a leap. But when one considers that millions of dollars were raised and leveraged toward the, the pro-gay marriage bill and more dollars were raised post-ratification, we will also have to contend with the reality that such capital rarely lands, if at all, in the coffers of those committed to doing work on behalf of those with limited access, like queer and trans youth of color, those with access to educational, without access to educational programs, um, particularly as they, or, as they are, are um, organized for queer and trans urban youth, social and economic justice programs focused on ameliorating and removing the conditions impacting the poor, the jobless, homeless queers, and are those with limited state rights and privileges like those queers in non-married relationships, whether mon monogamous or polyamorous, sex workers, et cetera. This is the work and representations that might easily be covered in pink and left unnamed under the marker of celebratory gay marriage. Consider, for example, the news report posted in the crime section of the Daily News a week or so after the passing of the marriage equality bill entitled, quote, Chaos on Christopher, Iconic Village Stretch Overrun by Drug Dealers, Prostitute, Violent Youths. The revolting article which caricatured the mostly black and brown queer youth and adults who take to Christopher Street typically at night and on the weekends as societal pestilence, is silent regarding the conditions, the tools of surveillance, 
placement of very bright floodlights on highly populated intersections, increased police presence in car and on foot, white male guards protecting shops, etc., which produce certain results, like creation of high-risk areas, performances of presumed criminality in response to the watchful gaze of citizens and police, antagonism between business owners and those visitors and residents who use them. This report presented an opportunity for gay activists invested in gay uplift to step in and redirect attention to a larger problem, namely the lack of safe spaces affecting the lives of queer and trans urban youth of color. As of yet, I have not witnessed such a response, even in the joyous hills of celebration. Such is the distance between Stonewall's Christopher Street and the, Chris the Christopher Street that is a safe space for our queer youth of color today who are too young to marry. Pink washing is insidio insidio insidious precisely because it is a, it is a process of op op this is a lot of words with all of these endings. <laughs> <laughs> of obscuring <ma> <laughs> Why did I put that word there? Um, it's a process of obfuscation, masquerading as celebration. It is a process of selectively highlighting the progressive gay rights afforded to Israelis, for example, while obscuring, if not wholly disremembering, the fact that the rights of Palestinian gays are restricted, occupied, walled in by state-ordained laws. It illuminates only to veil. In this case of New York State, a space where a number of gay marriages, uh, with a number of gay marriages and the monies earned by the state because of those marriages have increased, we face an alarming trend of homelessness among queer and trans people, young people. It's a national problem, but the problem is invisibilized under the guise of gay marriage and equal rights celebration. Closing. The material realities of structural violence continue in the lives of our young people. For example, the Center for American Progress reported that there are an estimated number of 1.6 million to 2.8 million homeless youth in the United States. Of that alarming number, they also estimate that 20 to 40 percent of those numbers are gay, are transgender, compared to only 5 to 10 percent of, of the overall youth population. The average age that lesbian and gay youth become homeless in the state of New York specifically is 14 years old. Transgender youth, 13 and a half. I don't know where they got that from years old. CAPS numbers are corroborated by a 2005 study funded by the New York City Council, which found that almost one third of New York's homeless youth identify as lesbian, gay, bisexual, or, trans or transgender. It's fair to argue that the numbers may have increased since 2005, but who cares? And who does not? Are house care assessed and achieved when pink wash merits equality celebration? like the pink wash celebration of gay rights in Israel, invisibilizes these ills. The work of queer and trans advocates in New York State and beyond must be recalibrated such that we are prepared to illuminate limited liberalist pink wash argumentation and politics and do something about it. But we also need to, to do that in spaces like this. Thank you. Um, thank you guys for a really, uh, really great panel. Thanks for sticking to time. That actually means we do have um, uh, almost a half an hour for, um, for conversation. So I want to open up the floor just to throw a couple things out there, a couple things that struck me across the panel. Um, I thought the way that scale came up um, across the papers was super interesting, um, sort of from globe to nation to city, and even down to kind of neighborhood village and village, which has a very resonant, um, has a lot of resonance in sort of queer history, um, gay history to think about, and, and sort of older conditions of, of reduced mobility um, in, in queer populations. So, and I was really intrigued by what Jack said about the idea that sort of traveling between the scales or disruptions of scale, that in that kind of transfer between scales, there might be a sort of possibility for resistance there. So uh, just one thing that struck me, I was also thinking a lot about um, the question of analogy. Something that comes up clearly in pro-pinkwashing uh, media campaigns, uh, Tel Aviv is the San Francisco of the Middle East, but I think also a tool that's sort of in our bag when we think about something like settler logics, right, or sort of logics in general, there's a kind of politics of comparison or analogy there. Um, and how to think about, about that seems like a kind of interesting method question to me. Um, and finally, I just wanted to think about the relationship between this um, really important, um, very timely, groundbreaking work and a kind of older tradition of queer thought, um, queer critique. That really came up for me with the borrowing of the capitalism and gay identity um, title. And, um, and again, sort of thinking about like what is our relationship to the history of thinking about these kinds of questions of, of complicity um, 
And so, in a sense, um, I think, uh, you know, I'd sort of be interested to think about, like, what is the relationship in, implied in that citation, right? Um, in a way, um, D'Amelio is giving us the tools to think about this genealogy of complicity, but he could also be implicated in that critique in a certain way. So I was just sort of interested in the ambivalence of that citation. Just wanted to throw that out there as a few things that I noticed, but I'm just going to open it up now. Um, if the panelists have questions for each other, um, but especially if you guys have questions or, or thoughts. Yeah. No, no, I didn't. No. So the, um, but the gay ghetto. I was thinking about this where you were talking, and I'm interested to see what you. It was, I the, I don't know the. It was really informally used, and I first found it in the literature in, in Levine, 1979. I was talking about male homosexuals, and then, but in 1983, Castells, Manuel Castells, is writing about you know the 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 Castro, and he's like, no, it's a neighborhood. Look what they've done with the real estate. So it's, it, I think that that's that goes directly into what you were saying is that the discursive renaming happens in 1983 too, and. That's something I trace a lot in my work. And actually, that's why I picked the year 1983 to start all of my research, is because D'Amelio writes capitalism, gay identity, and Castell's writes, it calls the Castro a gayborhood. Yeah, so there's like a huge shift in the mentality of how we see gay people in that year in gay space. The, sorry, the question Brian. I have is actually for um, Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I speak else, or my dissertation is on um, solidarity tourism, so I, of course, talk about the, the difficulties and the problems with solidarity tourism, uh, with critiques of questions like voyeurism, with critiques of questions like duration in terms of how long t solidarity tourists are staying in Ida refugee camp, how long they're, they're spending in each space that they go to. Um, but I think that what's important about it is actually, I, for anyone who wasn't able to go to the keynotes yesterday, Hanin, Mikey asked the question, are you in solidarity with Palestinian queers or are you in solidarity with Palestine? And I think that that question is really, really important because I think that solidarity tourism, and I'm not talking about, in this paper, I'm not talking about the the LGBT delegation, I'm talking about the practices, the daily practices of Palestinian organizers and guides who are inviting internationals to come to the West Bank and organizing tours and do this on a daily basis, see rotating tourists come through mm -hmm. um, every day. And all of my interviews in Palestine were with Palestinian organizers and guides about the work that they do and why they do it. Mm -hmm. And that their work is pivots on the question of, are you in solidarity with Palestine? Mm -hmm. And how can I teach you how to be in solidarity with Palestine? Mm -hmm. So that, um, to me, is, a, is a, a response. And also what I spoke about today in terms of questions of mobility, of showcasing immobility, of showcasing the contours of occupation, of, of delineating what occupation looks like as a pedagogical endeavor is a response to the kind of logic that uh, pink wash that fuels pink washing and animates pink washing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If people in the back here, 
Use the mic. We're not going to be the only ones with the mic. <laughs> very Elvis. That's very. That's very I feel like a rock star. <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> so I live in West Philadelphia um, and do a lot of do some organizing work with Philly BDS. And uh, last month, with a broad coalition of student groups and others in Philadelphia, we did a, a protest of the Jewish National Fund fundraiser. Um, and the host and chairman of the JNF fundraiser is the CEO also of Campus Apartments um, in West Philadelphia. So. <laughs> He's actually profiting and perpetuating <laughs> gentrification in West Philadelphia in partnership with the University of Pennsylvania, Drexel University, the city of Philadelphia, and the federal government, um, and colonizing West Philadelphia and Israel um, <laughs> and Palestine, sorry. Um, so I just wanted to ask more about what's happening in San Francisco um, to counter gentrification and how we can more substantively like make those links. So it's a, it, San Francisco is a really complicated. It's a complicated thing to talk about for me to talk about gentrification in San Francisco because it's been a financial capital since 1848 or whatever, right? So it's really hard to think of it as. I think when we think about gentrification, we think about like previous orders and previous neighborhoods that are sort of colonized by capital, basically. And and San Francisco was constituted by capital. I mean, we all were, right? But like it was a it was an elite city to begin with, right? And it was actually only through the kinds of alternative histories that Rachel gestured to in her talk that we think of San Francisco as a liberal place to be at all, right? It's because of the sort of activist histories and sort of work that people did in the city to make it a safe that's a space that's somewhat safer for alternative folks, right? Um, so it's hard to think about gentrification in that way because I think it's just San Francisco returning to its elite roots in, in some ways, right? Um, so that's sort of clarifying comments. Um, I'm not the best person to ask in terms of like tactical stuff because I've been writing my dissertation for the past year and I'm like out of touch, honestly. <laughs> um, but I will say that there are a lot of people working really hard, especially in the Mission District, um, because, um, you know, like Mark Zuckerberg just bought an apartment in the Mission and like Twitter, in between Twitter and Facebook and Airbnb and whatever else we can keep listing them, um, the rents are out of control and it's bleeding into Oakland and it's bleeding into the other sort of places in the Bay that were once more affordable. And so there's a lot of energy and a lot of critique um, happening um, be because it's making it an unaffordable place to live for really like normal middle class people, not to mention working class and, and the working poor. So um, that's my partial answer. You want I to take a little bit? Okay, good. Okay, great. <laughs> so speaking more like things going on on the ground, I know Gay Shame does a lot of work uh, against gentrification, and um, they just recently put out some information about uh, Polk Street gentrification, mm -hmm. and they got their website taken down for it because uh, they, like, named someone's name, and they, like, got mad and took, a, took the website down. I think it's back up now. But um, there's also like been a lot of like community meetings in the mission that have been going on recently. I haven't been able to attend them because I live in Oakland and it's it's far, even though it's so close. <laughs> um, and I know um, less formally against gentrification, but just trying to keep people where they need to be. There's um, homes, not jails, who they work to put people into houses often as squats, um, and also do other types of political things and like help people get legal recognition of where they're living. So there's a bunch of stuff going on. Yeah. Yes. Targets 
methods for divestment that you can think about that maybe connect up some of the issues? Because it seemed like what you were talking about in a way was the, the way that the anti-pinkwashing campaign got out of green line was kind of actually kind of mm -hmm. like a kind of modern army thing rather than something broader that would respond both to gentrification and the demobilization mm -hmm. of LGBT movements and maybe Zionism and the colonization of Palestine. Mm -hmm. So I know that like the accompanying question for us sometimes are all over the place and doing multiple things. And you mentioned that there were other um, egregious sponsors of the festival. And I was just curious if you had any specific thoughts or if other folks had thoughts about campaign you know, kind of connect those things up or like what, what else should we be calling out besides the Israeli consulate and their investment? Right. Wells Fargo was on that list. <laughs> Every bank. Every bank, AT&T, uh, some hotels that are really fucked up. Um, I would have to look up some of that. I don't know off the top of my head. Every divestment company, I'm working on it. Um, but I know that there is something going on in San Francisco. Quit is doing a lot of a activism. and the, I, Kips? Is it Kips? Does, do you know? There's this... Um, this store that just started stocking SodaStream. And so like every week they're going to this store and handing out flyers and doing street theater. Cliffs, thank you. Okay, yeah. So that's the one thing I can direct you to, but other than that, I would, I would really have to do some research. <laughs> Can I, can I just reframe that question a bit, though, mm -hmm. and, and ask, um, not only do I think we should consider the sort of larger, very visible, um, like, corporations, right, mm -hmm. um, in terms of divestment campaigns, I also think there is a need for some sort of self-reflexive analysis on our part mm -hmm. as movements um, and look at our own divestments. And I'm using this in a different way. What movements are we divesting our energies from, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think there is a, a way in which a lot of attention is often paid to the big monsters in the room. What companies should we be divesting from? How should we target our campaigns? While we suffer from some of our own complicities um, at the level of, com of co you know, coalition and solidarities and also at the level of individual. <laughs> um, so there is a way in which I also need to ask myself that question. Um, in which ways do I also need to be thoughtful about a lot of these intersecting types of issues that come up that I often am not, because my politics are typically singular. Mm -hmm. so just another. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Warm up a little bit, huh? Um, that was a really awesome panel. Um, and I think uh, one of the things I appreciated most about it was making these connections between settler col uh, colonialism in the Middle East and in, in uh, Palestine and settler colonialism here. So this, this concern kind of came up a lot with uh, your talk, Rachel, um, about gen the relationship between gentrification and settler colonialism. And thinking about how um, so in a place like Hawaii, uh, the gentrification that happens and is happening there is 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 settler colonialism. It is literally a, a displacement of native populations in Hawaii. Um, but I think it, it looks a little different in the Castro or in the West Village, where those displaced populations are are non-native. Um, that you know even marginalized populations are still settler populations in in many places and spaces. Um, so I, I guess my my concern was was about uh, in, in drawing this connection between gentrification and other colonialism, um, not alighting the, the actual native people in in North America. Um, and so I, I guess my question is, how do we uh, situate? And this is, I think, for everyone, I think this applies to m most of the talks. Is how do we situate the queer person of color um, in talking about settler colonialism and the relationship between settlers and natives, um, and talking about belonging and talking about space and talking about place? Uh, how do we situate the queer person of color, uh, non-native queer person of color, as uh, both settler and marginalized, as gentrified, but also also settler? Mm -hmm. <laughs> just that. Okay. Just that. <laughs> just that. I'll I'll take that sort of partially, and then I'm hoping that my panelists will chime in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
calling you all out a little bit. Okay, thank you. Um, Because I think that's such an incredibly important question. And I think that um, part of the difficulties of making stuff more complicated is that we sort of run into this moment of... um, of a, of a kind of contradiction that is really difficult to neatly explain or think about, right? And that is one of the points at which we're like, there are very clear um, hierarchical systems of power in this country that disenfranchise min- multiple groups of people, and yet we are all settlers if we are non-native, mm-hmm. you know? And so it, it, I think it's about re-imagining um, uh, our understanding of settler colonialism a little bit um, to sort of understand that it's not just about um, it, it about it, it is about the relationship of uh, settler to native and is also about the relationship of settler to slave and also about the relationship to um, the sort of colonize, colonizing moves that made uh, Chinese Americans come to San Francisco as unpaid labor you know like a multiple histories that don't necessarily fit into native and settler um, binaries, but are still deeply uh, oppressive and hierarchical. So that's one answer. Mm-hmm. Um, I see a follow-up question, maybe. Yeah, I, so I was going to ask a very similar question, but in the other direction. So maybe we can think about it in both directions. So it's also, I understand that the logic, the settler logic, I like the idea of thinking about it as a logic. It allows you to make connections that are useful, but Mm -hmm. it is a logic. It's not Mm -hmm. an equation. And I'm a little bit worried about it being equation. So that in the, in the, in the other direction, it's not about who you're displacing in this settler-like behavior, but who, on who, in whose name. And it's different in gentrification than it is, uh, you know, in the name of a state, in the name of a, business in the name of um, uh, an ideology, in the name of Zionism. I mean, there are very different sorts of relationships in whose name you're settling. And so I think that that's important to both learn in the logic to make connections, but to also <laughs> unlink and not say these are, these are the same, um, sit, they're not the same systems. What's mm-hmm. motivating uh, gentrification is not exactly the same set of power relations in either direction. So I'd love you guys to talk about that. What it allows you to see, but then what it doesn't allow you to say. Sure. There's a cafe slash bar in bed called Outpost, um, <laughs> right? Um, that was founded by two white gay men. It's a predominantly black Caribbean, West Indian uh, low-income neighborhood of color. Um, and I, 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 I randomly had one focus group in that uh, um, in my research, and five of the six of them lived in bed uh, and five of the six of them were white, and um, and they were discussing how how great Outpost was and how fun it was. And uh, Trey, who's, who was I quoted earlier, was West Indian, had grown up there and had never heard of it. And I was like, they called it Outpost, and there was no kind of realization of the. Um, of that settler uh, kind of play on words and the colonialism in that. Um, and then, and, and even with Outpost, they're like, it's kind of fun. Like we're making a new great place and we're setting up a CSA and uh, working on a co-op and um, that kind of, uh, that kind of uh, uh, gentrification, that it's not seen as gentrification, it's, it's making a, a space. That was what the language would be called that these women would use. Um, but uh, once you have your CSA and your brunch and your yoga, um, you're going to have families move in, and then the rent prices go up, and then you're not going to be able to afford it, which is why you can see lesbian queer gentrification moving from the West Village to the East Village to Park Slope and then exploding all through Brooklyn and Queens over 25 years. Um, that, that, and eventually, only when these women started talking over generations that they realized they were gentrifying themselves out, they're, they're part of the practice of gentrifying themselves out, you know, into one, one woman said, we're going to gentrify ourselves into the ocean, you know, be after Coney, what's after Coney Island. So uh, that's something that comes out of, of my research. I'm interested to see what you guys think. Yeah, I was going to mention, I mean, <laughs> uh, 11 beds die. <laughs> Uh-huh. And you said Elpo's. I said, no. Um, <laughs> but I love this question. That's a wonderful, like, so not only whose name, but I also, the, what come to mind when you were talking is um, sort of which bodies. Yeah. yeah. Whose names and which bodies 
do the processes of settler colonialism and gentrification either secure, make space for, um, or displace, right? So it's also a question of materiality as well, not just logic, not just sort of a, a theoretical question. It is a question of material. It's yeah. the mat who's, which bodies are secured through these processes? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's an interesting question to yeah. wrestle with. So I wanted to talk a little bit. I, I, um, I understand what you're saying about, well, first of all, I want to say Harvey Milk actually gentrified himself out of the Castro. So that's, that's interesting um, to follow up on what Jack was saying. But um, I wanted to respond a little bit about, um, yes, I recognize you know, settler colonialism and gentrification have different uh, systems of power, maybe, but they're still in dialogue with each other, you know? Um, and just to like, one thing I know a lot about, because one of my very best friends is Israeli, and she grew up in South Tel Aviv, which is a low-income, Mizrahi-dominant neighborhood, is the links in Israel between gentrification and expansion of settlement, because mm -hmm. a lot of the settlements are public housing. And so it's like a question like, what happens with gentrification? Where do those people go? And these two things are linked here, and they're linked in Israel. So I think that it's important to drop these connections and... Um, it's really important to me to like recognize that it is settler logic. G gentrification is settler logic to me. Um, and it does displace bodies. And because bodies are coming in and saying, ooh, I'm scared. This is such a scary neighborhood. Let's call the police and, you know, whatever, you know? And so I feel like it's really important to understand that the... Um, logic of gentrification is parallel or, you know, very close mm -hmm. to settler colonialism, and they hold each other up. Okay, I think we have time for one last question, so go for it. Just have a quick question for Rachel again. Uh, going back to Darren's point on uh, our own role, our own complicity, complicity, I guess. Um, so protest, as a, I, I found it really interesting that you you were trying to you were critiquing, starting to critique protest, and I was thinking um, the role between uh, protests and um, the branding of a city as this kind of youthful um, countercultural paradise. <laughs> so um, protest as a strategy does. Uh, does increase, does accrue the cultural capital of a place that then becomes so uh, interesting because it's, because it's not just cleansiness and beautification that makes, that is part of that process. It's also youthful rebellion and um, tr capitalism loves to incorporate transgression within itself. And so to, to then try and unpick a little bit the, the mode of protest as something that can also be very easily part of the brand. I, I'm, I don't really know about America, but um, in, uh, in Europe, Berlin is quite ob obviously um, a very strong example of that and, a very, and an extremely problematic example of, of that, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. So if I'm understanding you right, you're asking about how protest is complicit in, in the, the beautification and gentrification of a city. This is exactly what I saw in Oakland after Occupy Oakland started. Like, all these people started flooding in. They're like, oh, I want to be part of this. And it's like, where are you from? I mean, I did that, too, a long time ago. <laughs> um, I'm not from Oakland, so I'm a gentrifier and a settler and, like, also not from there. So, um, But I, have, I saw that a lot. Um, it's, uh, you know, the, the spectacle of the riot or the protest. People want to come and, like, help. And it's part of a savior narrative almost, you know, like, mm. which is, you know, how imperialism and colonialism are in dialogue with each other. And so, yeah, I, I, uh, I agree with you on that. And um, this was actually part of a 37-page chapter of my thesis. So I talked a little bit more about the complicities in protest in there, which you can find in the San Francisco State Library. <laughs> <laughs> and online very soon. <laughs> But we probably also want to think about what Darnell was saying about like how materially is protest capitalized, right? So I don't know. I, I just wanted to, to sort of expand on that a bit. Krisashkola, which was the anti-occupation, queer anti-occupation group active in Tel Aviv from about 2000 to about 2005, um, was very well known for a very visible sort of they called it like hijacking of pride parades with like lots of um, sort of more performance-based um, uh, tactics. And 
after the, they sort of stopped being as active, um, I had a conversation with Dalit Baum, who was one, was one of the founding members, and she said that one of her critiques after it was all over, right, like not during, in the moment, was the, precisely this, was that you, you become part of the machine, the spectacle becomes part of the machine because capitalism loves um, to, to, you know, any kind of transgressive energy becomes part of capitalism, right? And so, um, I mean, we didn't come up with a solution, but I think that it's something that people are recognizing in many forms, in many sort of spaces. So I don't but know the answer is, but That's I, the moment now, yeah. right? Like capitalism loves transgression now. I mean, what will happen in 60 years when my, the 50s might happen again, you know? So yeah. it's the moment. <laughs> well, I think yeah. this is it. Like your, your talk is exactly this, this example of like the Stonewall riots become, you know, a way oh. to attract capital into the oh, into totally. Christopher yeah, Street. And yeah. so it's it's not there's no way to know how our stories are going to be told yeah. in the future. Yeah. Please thank the panelists.